Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, what a rare privilege we have before us now as well. Um, we are going to have a debate with your questions. We're going to go about 30, possibly 40 minutes, depending on how we go and depending on how the conversation goes. And the conversation here with this amazing panel is treating the climate crisis like a crisis. This is going to be a conversation on rapidly accelerating the energy transition as well. The topics covered will include the fact that the climate crisis, climate crisis remains at the heart of global attention and it must not slip down the ranking in terms of top priorities. And I can tell you already, ladies and gentlemen, that that is going to come up straight away because in there, in the rarefied halls of the World Economic Forum, there is a danger, there is a concern that the climate crisis is slipping down the agenda. We're going to talk about 1.5 degrees. Is it dead? Yeah, the pathway is narrow but still achievable. I think everybody on this panel still believes that as well. Clean energy transition is at a turning point. It is happening, but it's not fast enough, according to many, many people. Again, I think what you're going to find today is there's a lot of accord between what the IEA is saying, which, let me remind you, represents the OECD nations, represents the consuming nations uh, on energy products, and a lot more than that as well. Uh, and there is an urgent need to scale up actions and investments, advanced economies, especially need to do more. Um, I already know what this panel thinks about the COP process. Um, so should you if you've been paying attention. I'll tell you who's here. What an amazing meeting of minds. Dr. Fatih Birol is uh, someone I've known for many years and I've had the privilege of um, a lot of private conversations with and a lot of public conversations with as well. Uh, he, of course, is Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Vanessa Nakate is a Ugandan climate justice activist, UNICEF Goodwill, Ambassador, it's lovely to see you today. Uh, Louisa Neubauer is a climate activist. Hello, Louisa. Uh, and founder of Friday's Future Germany. Um, we also have Helena Gualinga, who is an Ecuadorian environmentalist and human rights activist. It's lovely to see you. And Greta Thunberg, who is a Swedish climate justice activist. Uh, one or two of you may well know the ladies here as well. So there are a lot of questions. You've got a lot of questions as well. But I'm just going to start off with a very open question to the people here today, and I'm going to start off, and I'll just go from my immediate right, and I'll work all the way down to Dr. Birol at the end. Greta Thunberg, um, I'm just going to ask you what your message is for the World Economic Forum here today, and it's very nice to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you uh, for being here, and thank you for, yeah. Um, so we, we are right now in Davos, where the... Basically, the people who are f mostly fueling the destruction of the planet, the people who are at the very core of the climate crisis, the people who are investing in fossil fuels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and yet somehow these are the people that we seem to rely on solving our problems, where they have proven time and time again that they are not prioritizing that. They are prioritizing self, self greed, corporate greed. Um, and short-term economic profits above people and above planets. And the, we, are listening, we seem to be listening to them rather than the people who are actually affected by the, cl uh, the climate crisis, the people who are living on the front lines. And, and that's, that kind of tells us the situation, how absurd this is. Um, so but the people who, who we really should be listening to are, are not here. Instead we are bombarded with messages from people who are who are basically the people who are causing th this crisis. Thank you, Vanessa. Well, for me, um, coming here, I, I didn't know exactly what my message would be because what haven't we said and what haven't we done, what haven't we you know, communicated enough? The climate crisis is evident in the areas that are most impacted. Most cases, these areas are least responsible for the crisis, where people are stretching their livelihoods, people are trying to survive, clinging uh, to, you know, clinging to their lives and just trying to make it for another day, to make it for another week, to make it for another hour, another minute. So for me, my message is the climate crisis goes beyond statistics and data points. It's about the people. And very so often in this place, there is a disconnection between you know, what is being discussed and what is happening 
on the ground. There is a, a mismatch between how people understand, you know, the urgency of the crisis here and what is happening in places like Turkana, one of the regions that is being impacted by the drought in the Horn of Africa, which I was able to visit last year. And I, I met different mothers, different children, children that are suffering from severe acute malnutrition. And it is, um, it is devastating to continue to see what um, the climate crisis is doing to communities and doing to children and different mothers across the world. And one specific child that stood out for me is a child that I met with his grandmother in a hospital where cases of severe acute malnutrition are referred for treatment. <laughs> and I, I remember meeting the grandmother and her explaining how you know, it took them long to find the treatment. And by the time they brought you know, the child to the hospital, he was in a in a wasted situation as described by the doctors and the nurses. And she was just praying that the child would survive. And I, I mean, a few hours later, we learned that this child had passed away. And this could have been our preventable death and our preventable crisis. So... I feel um, frustrated to, I just, I don't know what else to say because the urgency of the crisis is evident and people are dying and it's like our leaders are playing games and they don't see the challenge that is happening. I am frustrated and I'm so hurt by what is happening and the inaction. Why is it so hard for people to understand the urgency of what is happening? We could save very many, very many lives because so many people are stretching to try and survive the next minute, the next hour, the next week, the next day. And here, the discussions are on growth, development. Why don't we slow down a bit and talk about lives and people? It's just frustrating. Vanessa, thank you very much indeed for that. Helena. Um, I come from an indigenous community in the Amazon rainforest, and for decades we've seen how our forest has been cut down, again, in the name of development. Uh, in for oil exploration, for extractivism. The same industry that has caused the climate crisis is also destroying our territories. And uh, while they're at it, they're also committing human rights violations. Um, we don't see the sense of urgency reflected in action. Indigenous communities, indigenous peoples, youth, scientists, we've all been pointing towards a direction uh, where the oil industry is, is they're not going there. They're not going there, the world leaders are not going there. And something that Vanessa said, like we're frustrated, but what else, what else uh, can, can, can we do? We've said everything, we've, we've done everything we can, uh, and, you know, um, and, and still we're going into this really, really dangerous, dangerous direc direction. We're taking a really dangerous path. And we're already seeing how people are suffering on the ground. We, we see that every day in our lives. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it's completely insane that uh, we are allowing this. And we have people here in Davos that are enabling that. Uh, through government, through inv uh, investing in fossil fuel, um, and and uh, at some point there there needs to be a stop. This is criminal. Uh, this is this is criminal behavior, uh, and it should be judged as so as well. Louisa. Um, yes, I'm a climate justice activist from Germany, and I spent the last week with um, Greta and many others defending. <laughs> Um, livelihoods um, against uh, coal diggers in the Rhineland in Germany, which is the largest single source of CO2 of the whole of Europe. 
And many people then said, oh, it's an interesting change of scenery coming from the mud in Lützerath to Davos, whereas we walked through um, the dirty mud in, in Lützerath and now we in Davos uh, witnessing dirty deals being made, so I'm not sure how much of a change that actually is. Um, Chancellor Scholz yesterday said that the future belongs to renewables, and I think there's one part of the sentence that he left out, which is the future does not belong to the fossil fuels. And if we look at the business plans, however, of the big fossil fuel industries worldwide, 96% of oil and gas industry um, plan to expand, even though we know that the science is very clear, the, the numbers are very clear, there cannot be any fossil fuel expansion happening everywhere. Yet the business plans and the investments plans, they tell a different story. And what does it mean? What kind of message is um, coming from that? And the message is, I think, quite clear. The future will not belong to the fossil fuel industries, but they won't lead into that future themselves. As long as fossil fuels get to make the rules of the end of the fossil fuel era, there will not be an end of the fossil fuel era. Someone will have to draw the line. Someone will have to say enough is enough and end the destruction. And that end, and I think we can be certain here, will not come from the industries themselves. And it will not come from slow plans to transition to somewhere. Right now, we see that across the world, an expansion and, inter, um, and an intention is, playing, is, is being planned when it comes to fossil fuels. So as long as fossil fuel industries are planning to expand, someone else will have to say no to that. That's where we're turning to the EIA. That's where we're turning to governments worldwide. That's why we're going to the streets. And we also know that as long as investors like BlackRock, like Deutsche Bank, like Qatar, who are the lead investors of RWE, who we fought against last week, as long as they plan to invest in new fossil fuels, they are on the, right, on the wrong side here. And maybe they don't want to know that, but um, we can be very certain about that, and we're not going to shy away from spreading that message. Thank you, Louisa. Look, one thing that's very clear is that seeing four very powerful activists here on the outside of WEF is very interesting. But, but in terms of bringing the dialogue with powerful institutions such as the IEA, I think it is absolutely fabulous that A, the four of you are here, but B, that Fatty, you have come as well. Because not only are you here, uh, and, and, and I think it's, it, it's great that you are, but you've also got a view to what's going on in there. Now, the ladies have already said that um, there is inaction going on inside the halls of the Congress. They have already said that um, there is no sense of action despite the words, despite we've just had COP27. Well, I was at COP26, so we're at COP21, uh, 15. What, how different is what you're hearing here to the sense of urgency in there, Patty? Uh, thanks, uh, Steve. First of all, many thanks for the invitation. I think me being uh, here is already a very important uh, signal that uh, I wanted to uh, give the world. But may I first... Uh, First things first, may I first thanks to, uh, thank to uh, Greta. Vanessa, dear Vanessa, thank you very much. Helena and Luisa, uh, thank you very much uh, what uh, you have been doing. Steve, my message is the following. <coughs> Energy is uh, responsible about 80% of the emissions causing climate change. Okay? If we are not able to transform the energy sector we have no chance whatsoever to reach our climate targets. So we have to transform the energy sector, making it uh, clean, making it uh, secure. And when I uh, look at the, uh, today the international agenda, the global agenda, including uh, here in Davos, why we have to see that the uh, climate change needs to get more attention Unfortunately, the attention to climate change is sliding down. I find it uh, uh, rather uh, worrying, and uh, it is the reason I thought it is now time uh, to ring the alarm bells, uh, bring the uh, climate crisis together with other crises, the energy crisis, food crisis, at the uh, top of the international uh, policy agenda. And I think this is my uh, main message climate agenda needs to get it is a priority in the agenda of the uh, decision. Let me just get something straight, Patty, okay. because um, the activists believe 
there should be no new fossil fuels projects in order to hit 1.5 degrees. You believe there should be no more fossil fuel um, exploration, production, new facilities to reach 1.5 degrees. Why is it that the most preeminent pre organisation, perhaps globally, certainly amongst consuming nations, is saying that, and yet new production is going ahead? So, uh, Steve, the issue is we have to keep the temperature increased to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If it goes above that, the, the rather fragile equilibrium of our planet will be distorted. We'll be all in trouble. In order to, to do that, the, we need to get energy from <coughs> clean, carbon-free energy sources. Okay? And to do that, the, the magic word is investment. Today, investment in clean energy, today the world invests about $1.5 trillion dollar in order to be in line with our climate targets, it needs to go to $4 trillion, clean energy investments. And most of them need to come from the developing countries, hopefully with the help of the uh, rich advanced countries. Now, if we do that, if we bring our energy from clean energy sources, then we don't need any more coal, we don't need any more oil and gas new investments there. But the point of departure is making clean energy investments and having a clean, secure energy future for all. And there is enough money worldwide, there is enough capital. What we have to do is capital and clean energy projects, especially in developing countries, need to uh, meet. And uh, what is missing in my view is the uh, international political will. If it was there, this would have uh, happened because we have enough uh, sun, we have enough uh, uh, wind, and electric cars are uh, growing. There's a lot of technological innovation and we have a lot of potential to see the clean energy to dominate. But uh, unfortunately, what we are seeing today is there's a transition happening, but not at the pace that we would like to see, especially once again in the emerging and uh, developing world. Thank you, Fatih. Greta, you have spoken inside the realms of the COP process. You have spoken outside of the UN FCCC process. You have been inside WEF talking and now you're outside. I've done a lot of work just looking at what the way you've changed and you just seem to be on the outside now rather than talking to people on the inside. Uh, and I think that's a great shame because I've been speaking to some amazing people in there the last week, including the Pakistan Minister for Climate Change who is incredibly powerful, about 1,000 kilometer lakes that just appeared, about farmers having to deal with 50 degree plus heat as well. Do you not feel that your very strong voice actually would continue to do good work if you were actually talking to those powerful people uh, and to those people and just giving them some leadership? Well, first of all, I, there are uh, already activists doing that. Um, and I think that if there should be activists in, in inside speaking to these people, it should be those on the front lines and not privileged people like me who are not experiencing the first-hand consequences of the climate crisis. Uh, but then again, um, I think that right now the changes that we need are not um, very likely to come from from the inside. Rather, I believe they will come from, from the bottom up, so to speak. Um, because without public pressure, without massive public pressure from the outside, at least in my experience, um, these people are going to go as far far as they possibly can. As long as they can get away with it, they will continue to invest in fossil fuels. They will continue to, to throw people under the bus for their own gain. Um, so I believe that the changes we need right now needs to happen uh, on the outside. We need to build and create a critical mass of people who demand change, mm -hmm. who demand justice. Um, and of course, we could do that also from from the inside. But yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, Helena, I mean, Ecuador is suffering its own concerns and deforestation and oil groups and gas groups and what have you. Just, just tell us, again, where you see the, the campaign going forward, because I, I think many of us feel that we have to be pragmatic in terms of working with and understanding the pressure from the outside as well. How do you see the campaign going forward from here? I, I completely agree with, uh, with Greta that we need to build massive movement of people that are demanding change and are demanding justice. Um, 
and when we are talking about the you know energy transition, when we're talking about the green transition, we also need to make sure that that is just. And I think that's really, really important that we have um, voices uh, from the places that are being affected both by climate change, but also by the place, uh, what, what the energy transition would, would mean for, for communities on the ground, vulnerable communities. Um, and, and, and I think that perspective really needs to be taken into account by the private sector, and, and it's a perspective that uh, cannot be left out. Um, because if we do that, we're leaving out people again, li just like we've done um, during you know the, the entire climate crisis. Um, and I would like to um, we've, together with Greta, Vanessa, Luisa, and I, we've cre created a cease and desist letter um, uh, to oil CEOs, urging the oil CEOs to uh, face out from fo new fossil fuel. Um, they, we know that they knew. Uh, there's a report that's come out saying that they knew uh, way before us what they were doing when they were exploring for oil. They knew what the consequences would be of uh, CO2 gas emissions. They knew the irreversible consequences, the huge impact it would have on people's livelihood, it, the huge impact it would have on the environment. Um, we launched this a couple of days ago and we're almost reaching 900,000 signatures, which really shows the commitment of youth, which really shows the commitment of, of, of civil society and people and the change that we are demanding. Um, and this is a message to, to these uh, CEOs and decision makers of how urgently we want and we need change. And we are um, very happy to see that this message is in fact in line with what the EIA says very clearly, that there cannot be any fossil fuel um, expansion happening anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, fossil fuel industries had 40 years time to prove that they're up to anything good. They clearly failed. And so um, the message is very clear, and this is not just clear to us activists, it is clear to people everywhere, especially those fighting um, at the front line. So we are very happy for you um, to be here today, and um, we would um, very much invite you to carry on this message um, with us, uh, Mr. Birol. So we already have our uh, open letter on 20 f uh, no, 18th of May, 2021, when we made the, uh, the clean transformation of the global energy sector, net zero 2050. We made our uh, report. So uh, we are very happy to see that the there will be a big increase, hopefully, for clean energy investments, mm -hmm. not uh, fossil investments, so that we can both have energy, because energy is a good thing. What is better is the emissions. So we'll have a both energy, and uh, we are going to reduce the emissions and their impact on uh, the climate. So I am uh, uh, very happy that the, the, uh, the our activist colleagues uh, here are pushing this agenda forward. Louisa, let me just come back to you, and, and I, I, a little gentle pushback as well, because I, I, I understand what's been going on at Guts Violets Bay, and, and I understand why you were there as well, but when you look at the longer message from Herr Scholz, he said the following, we aim to be 100% energy uh, from renewable sources by 2035, wind and solar to reach 80% by 2030, Germany will be climate neutral by 2045. This is a good progression, this is a good result in many ways. There are other crises going on in the world. We, the, the catchphrase here, and they love a catchphrase here at uh, WEF, is polycrisis, keeping the lights on in Europe, fighting against the Russians in Ukraine as well. This has created new dynamics and other crises. And I understand what all of you are saying, including Fatih, about climate initiatives slipping down the agenda, but actually the short-term remedies to actually keeping the lights on in Europe, action has to be made. And I know you're going to push back at me there. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Well... What we see since really the climate movement started and um, really emerging in a different scale across the globe, there has been a response by leaders and that was um, a friendly message to the PR departments um, for more green headlines. And so we are ve well aware that leaders across the world and also Mr. Schultz, they, they know their vocabulary and they know, you know where something net zero has to happen and something green has to you know, be put out. Um, but we don't say listen to, a sci to the science um, for a joke. We say, and I think that is clear to people across the world, what effectively counts is the numbers, it's the science. And when we look at what is behind all those big promises, in many, in many cases, and that is the case in Germany, what we see is a, is a 
public breakup with the Paris Agreement that is being performed. And when I look at countries like Germany, we are on the top five of global, you know, um, of, the, uh, of the top polluters worldwide. There are few countries that are as responsible as Germany and, and the G7, of course. Who would we turn to if it comes to sticking to pledges made in Paris? Who are those countries are we expect to provide the finance, to provide the industrial transformation, if not those countries, if they don't, you know, start to deliver? And so, um, yeah, luckily enough, the science is clear, the numbers is clear, and we don't have to be fooled anymore. And uh, people are rising up everywhere. Just the other week, there were 30,000 people protesting with us against the extension of the coal mine with support from across the world. And we're really seeing that the PR strategy that hoped you could just mark away the climate crisis is not working out, whereas the people are there and they are willing to tell the truth. Steve, can I say something here? I think we can have some, when we look at the energy world today, we can have some uh, slight optimism, leg legitimate optimism uh, here. Because uh, last year, 2022, the amount of renewable capacity coming to markets was the record high. We have never seen such so much renewables coming around the world. Very good. The efficiency improvements, very strong, and a lot of clean energy technologies are growing. The issue is, there are two issues here. One, they are not growing fast enough, they should be, to be in line with 1.5. The second, for me, the, the, the nerve center of the problem, the emerging and developing countries in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. There is, a, I think, a moral responsibility of the advanced economies so. to support the clean energy transition in the emerging world. This is key, in I, my view. I absolutely agree. And, and I want to ask Vanessa and, and, and Greta a question on this, it's different questions. Vanessa, um, one of the key parts of the UN FCC process and, and COP27 has been that actually financing for developing nations is being seen as absolutely key to the success. We can't just have the rich West uh, finding renewables if there isn't support for the developing nations. Are you seeing any evidence of that on your travels? And, and of course, your, your heartbreaking experiences. Is there any evidence that some of those promises are getting to ground zero? Well, um, I can speak from the most recently established loss and damage fund um, at COP27. It's, it was established, but it's still an empty bucket with no money at all. And uh, you know, coming here at Davos, again, um, you mentioned something about the energy crisis, uh, keeping the lights on for Europe and you know the West. I understand that this is not the West Economic Forum. This is the World Economic Forum. And many times the discussions about the interests of the you know the Western countries, how can we ensure that we address this, you know, in Europe, how can we ensure that we address this? But then there's been an ongoing energy crisis, for example, um, in the global south on the African continent for decades with over 600 million people with no access to basic electricity. So I think that this really needs to be treated like um, a, world, a, a world economic forum because I think the world doesn't only constitute of Europe and you know the West in general. So I just really wanted to say something on that previous question that you asked, that if there is an energy crisis, it's not just in Europe, it has been there for decades, and we need the you know, massive scale up of renewables, um, especially in communities that are experiencing energy poverty or that have been experiencing energy poverty for decades. So yes, uh, there is a need for that uh, finance for adaptation. There is a need for real money for loss and damage because with whatever you know crisis that um, we see, um, it's already it's already um, it's multiple um, in the countries, for example, in the global south. And even the discussions of, you know, 1.5, you know, as the ultimate space of survival. But um, at 1.2 degrees, 
it's already a living hell for so many communities across you know the African continent across um, the global south so when we hear you know discussions of 1.5 as you know the place that will save us all maybe it's a place that will save the you know the western countries but at 1.2 it's already catastrophic for so many communities and that's why it's really important that you know we cannot have any new fossil fuel investment the un secretary general antonio guterres announced that the business models of um, fossil fuel companies are inconsistent with human survival they're inconsistent with human existence he already said it's more an economic madness to make any more of these investments so to ensure that people are protected not just in the west but the entire world we must phase out all new fossil fuels and that is coal oil and gas and massively support a transition to renewable energy especially in the global south thank you Let's just you to support when it's africa because yes, africa course. we don't talk much uh, now in Af sub saharan africa every second person doesn't have access to electricity it's number one number two two out of three households using primitive cook stores for cooking which creates a lot of respiratory diseases especially for women and children and it is the top three premature death reasons in sub-saharan africa this can be solved this problem both of them access to clean electricity and access to clean cooking with a very small amount of money to enough money to pay a one lng terminal uh, in one country you can solve the problem in entire sub-saharan africa just to put in a context um but i think the the only challenge is that we are only discussing about the energy crisis and like you've said um you know we often we don't talk about africa a lot i i really picked that and i think it's really problematic because it's like africa is an after is an afterthought or you know so um we're busy focusing on <coughs> privileged countries yeah. while leaving out communities that have been suffering for decades the world doesn't revolve only around the west yeah, yeah. And, and it's not just africa or the west or developing versus developed because the ramifications in terms of migration and social issues will affect the whole world if indeed these aren't addressed greta a very difficult question is how should the developing world be allowed to develop? Should we actually allow, or allow, we can't not allow, allow, but should it be okay for developing nations to use coal, to use oil, to use gas, to use fossil fuels so they can industrialize, so they can keep the lights on, so they can uh, provide feedstocks for agriculture? It's very tricky to know what developing nations should be allowed to do rather than, again, the rich West that this concentration uh, of a lot of this topic has been about. First of all, I think that the term developing countries is a bit misleading. It's not like they are underdeveloped, it's more like they are overexploited by other countries um, like, like ours. And I don't, I don't think I'm in the position to tell others what to do. Um, when, I mean, the climate crisis boils down to justice and, and what's already happened. This is a cumulative crisis. Uh, what we do, uh, the emissions we emit stay in the atmosphere for a very, very long time and will continue to destabilize the biosphere uh, for many, many generations to come. Um, and of course, not only environmental effects, but also thus people. Um, so who am I to, to say that I've had these privileges, um, but now others that haven't been able to, to do so shouldn't because we are facing a, uh, a, a crisis and so on. Of course, that's what the very roots of this crisis is this mindset that some people are, are more worth than others and so on, that we, we seem to be sacrificing people um, for this. And this just, the thing that this does is that it only puts um, the so-called Western world in, in an even more responsible um, position. No, not responsible, but you get what I mean. We have a even, an even bigger responsibility. Uh, to, yeah, that's, 
um, because to compensate and to make sure that uh, equity is is um, is at the heart of climate action, we cannot continue to overlook these these effects, and it needs to be embedded in every conversation, every discourse, and yet it is still completely absent. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, we have a limited amount of time left. Um, I'm seeing all the hands going up. Uh, this gentleman's been very patient. He's put his hand up four times as well. Um, if you just tell everybody who, what your news organization, who you are, uh, and then direct your question. Thank you. David Janus, New York Times. This November, COP28 will be hosted in the United Arab Emirates, one of the world's largest oil producers. And the UAE has selected its head of its state-owned oil company as the head of the procedure. Greta, what does that say to you? about the procedures, about COP, and how does it affect your expectations about what you can expect from the COP? Um, Greta's just asked if we can make this an open question. Maybe if one of you wants to answer, maybe you could get, give a, a, a conclusion on it as well afterwards. Um, Louisa, Helena, do you want to pick up? Well, obviously, it's, it's ridiculous, um, and it's not new, though. We've seen the last COP in, in Egypt and how fossil fuel lobbyists flooded that space. So why should that change? if you know, nobody um, who is in the position of power demands those places to be uh, working towards justice and not just towards more lobby deals. I just think it's, it sends a message also where, where we're headed right now for putting the heads of fossil fuel companies to lead uh, you know, climate negotiations. We've had them investing and uh, in, in COPs for decades now, and we've seen where that has led us, which is nowhere. Um, it, and it, there's a huge interest of conflict there, uh, and it's, it just sends this message of actually not taking it seriously. And it's, I think it's exactly what they're doing. They're not taking this seriously. Vanessa, do you want to pick up on this as well? No? Uh, and just find a word from your question yeah, I mean, that? lobbyists have been influencing these conferences for since basically forever. Um, and this just puts a very clear face to it. Um, yeah, exactly. As previous panelists have said, it's completely ridiculous. Um, I think, we, who's on the next question? Is this gentleman here? Okay. My name is Hannes Hoff. Tagesordnung hat the win, Mr. Duro. Germany, France now, and of course, is in favor of exploiting new gas resources off the coast of Senegal, West Africa, and he argues new gas resources would be a bridge for developing countries to get rid of coal power plants. What do you think of that argument? No, first of all, uh, as I said, Africa, we have to look at Africa very, very closely. Now, in terms of electricity generation, I believe almost all the new electricity generation in uh, sub-Saharan Africa needs to come from renewables. It, it is cheap, especially solar. Let me give you one statistics which I find very uh, disturbing. As I said today, in sub-Saharan Africa, one out of two people have no electricity, number one. Number two, sub-Saharan Africa has 40% of the global uh, solar radiation, very rich. And uh, number three, uh, the solar is the cheapest source of electricity generation in Africa. Yet, yet, today, the amount of solar power capacity in sub-Saharan Africa is, just to give a context, one third of the solar power capacity in Belgium. Mm -hmm. Think of the map, global map. How big is the sub-Saharan Africa, how many people live there, and how big is uh, uh, Belgium? So from that point of view, there is a huge potential for electricity generation in sub-Saharan Africa. Having said that, there are some applications because the energy you don't need only for electricity generation, you need it for other things. Food processing, desalination of water. For these things, you may need a, a fuse which can create high temperature heat. And here you can use uh, gas. And here I would like to say that uh, uh, Africa's share in global emissions is 3% today. In if, even if, I don't think that it will happen, but even if Africa would develop all these natural gas resources, it will only go to 3.4%. So from that point of view, I would be very careful to put Africa in a different context than other uh, countries. You can't compare Africa with uh, other uh, countries here. Thank you.
Um, let's get a question from this lady over here. It is their money, first of all. It is not uh, uh, IES money. But I think I see three risks there. Uh, and because banks and others are saying they are putting this because of the energy crisis uh, we are in. The first risk is if you today decide, even decide today, to build a, a new uh, oil field, the first oil will come to the market in six, seven years of time. It will not come tomorrow. There is a delay here. It will not be immediately uh, ready. This is number one. Number two, I am not sure, I am not sure, seven years of time, the global oil demand will still increase and we will need more oil in the future because the electric cars are growing very strongly. There will not be demand, so that may be a business risk for those uh, banks. This is the second uh, point. And the third point is, it is a climate risk. From this three point of view, the timing doesn't uh, justify the, uh, this uh, uh, energy crisis doesn't justify this seven years. There's a business risk, and there is a also the climate crisis. In general, if I may, Steve, uh, one shouldn't imagine to uh, justify uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, some uh, large-scale uh, fossil fuel investments. One shouldn't use it as an excuse. Um, right, let's get a question from this gentleman here. He's been very patient. So what I'll do is just to say, I've got time for one more question after this. So one of you, will be, I haven't, I'm not looking yet. Um, and what I want to do is if I may start with all of you answering that question, if you would as well, and I'll start off with you, if you would, Louisa. And should we take another question to answer two maybe or not? Well, you've got two questions there anyway. Okay. Do you get, are you going down yeah, the litigation yeah. route and okay. what other route forward? Well, I think it's very clear that um, as an activist, what we do, we do what we do not because it's easy or because it's convenient, because, but because it's necessary. And um, we don't do it despite it's hard, but because it's, it's hard and it's a tough um, run. And what we see, though, is that we are joined by forces across the globe. And luckily enough, we are um, more than ever. And we see the most unlikely alliances are building up. Um, speaking of the protest in the, in the coal area in Germany, we were joined by farmers, by churches, by grandparents, by people from really um, across the place who uh, start understanding that, that this is their time to act. And the idea that, you know, the climate activists will save us all, it's, uh, it's another myth um, to uh, reassure in a time where there can't be reassurance on things. So that I think is a very important message. And speaking as someone who has successfully sued their own government, I think litigation, of course, is something that we will look at um, again and again and again. This is a letter to cease and desist, and I think looking at the at the legal context of that um yeah um it is of course there are more steps um that can be taken um there which i think is very important i would just like to maybe say one more thing about solving crisis because that came up from from you steve but also from the audience it's a fairy tale to tell that fossil fuels that new fossil fuels will solve any kind of crisis the energy crisis we're in is a fossil fuel energy crisis it is existing only because of a singular dependency on fossil fuels, in this particular fossil fuels from Russia. And um, what we're seeing is that new fossil fuels don't solve energy crises in Europe. 
but they produce crises across the globe. And whenever someone goes ahead and starts selling a new fossil fuel project as a solution to any kind of crisis, I think it's a journalistic duty, but also a public duty to challenge this and to ask um, what kind of crisis to be solved and which new crisis is to be produced here, which, as we heard on the panel, is very obvious, I think. May I add something here? Not yeah. now, yeah. but, no. but he we'll come back to that just one line. very briefly. The, I think that the lasting solution to our energy crisis go through clean energy yep. investments. Just wanted to mention. Thank you, Fadi. Helene. I think the reason why we do this is because we know we have something to defend. You know, uh, I, come, I, I come from the rainforest and living there. When I go back here, I go back to a clean river still. I go back to a rainforest that is standing, that is living, that is healthy. I go back to a people that has been fighting for decades. I have that, and I have something to defend. What I do can assure you is that we will be, excuse my French, a pain in the ass for everyone who's working towards uh, the new exploration of fossil fuels and uh, destroying our planet. And that, I think, I speak for all. Thank you. Vanessa. Well, I think that, you know, one of the challenges that I see is that there's so many people saying that they need us. There's so many people saying we are inspiring. There's so many people um, giving standing ovations, but few of them are joining us um, in our fight for climate justice. So I think that as we move forward, um, I mean, our activists are expected to be strong and all that, but it can be frustrating you know, it can be frustrating to see the inaction and to see the crisis um, continue to impact so many people. So I think we need to move from a place of uh, being told that we are needed um, to people joining us and working with us in, you know, whatever space that you're in, if it's um, in the law, if it's in the schools, if it's in media, whatever thing that you can do, like, play a part um, in our fight for yeah, climate justice. Congrats. Yeah, I mean, we are nowhere near the end. We have only just begun. Um, but no one said that this was going to be easy. It's, um, we know that the changes that we are advocating for are not going to happen overnight. Um, and um, that is why we, we have to stay strong during a longer period of time. But also we cannot do this uh, on our own. Cl the climate activists currently need to multiply many times. We need many, many more because we, I mean, we need, we need help. Right now, we are still moving in the wrong direction. We are speeding in the wrong direction. The glo global emissions of greenhouse gases are still increasing. We are heading completely in the wrong direction. We need many, many more, so we urge everyone to, to join the fight. for. Okay, I have got time for one short question. Um, I'm going to let the lady, and one short uh, question, and, and I guess very brief answers, because I know you've all got to move on as well. So this lady, yeah. And who you are, sorry? Why don't you start off on what you see, positive or negative, from the IRA, uh, and then we'll just move on and just ask if, 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 the, if the activists want to comment on this one as well. I, I was, uh, first of all, I should say, uh, Steve, uh, that I am a man who makes his hands dirty with data every single day, as you know, the energy data. And I have a, a, a definitely a view of a legitimate optimism as far as the clean energy is concerned today. It is growing, but the problem is it is not growing fast enough to reach our climate targets. So it is not something that it is stopping, it is growing now. In addition to uh, the, all the, the market forces, government decisions, and so on, the Inflation Reduction Act, in my view, is a very transformative uh, move from the United States giving about $400 billion President Biden and his uh, government to clean energy sources. It is solar, it is wind, it is electric cars, it is clean hydrogen and others. So therefore, I hope other countries and, and, and India is moving in the uh, same direction. I hope Europe will come with a response to address the uh, clean energy. They all together have to reach our clean energy goals. 
So this is my hope, okay. and Inflation Reduction Act is a step in that direction. So it's, it's, a, it's the public sector coming up with the carrot as well as stick. Does anyone want to comment on what's happening from the US government uh, and what you hope other governments to do in terms of incentivizing companies to uh, look for more green initiatives? I don't think we do there. I think, okay, right. Um, why don't I ask a very final question then? And I li literally want a 10 second answer from all of you as well. Uh, I do want to end this and try and say, is there anything that you're seeing at the moment? I can tell you what I see is optimistic, but I'll tell you afterwards as well. Do you see anything at the moment going on that gives you a cause for optimism? We'll just go down the line very quickly. Greta. Um, the, the people standing up and raising their voices against, against all that is happening. That's the hope right now. The hope comes from the people. Vanessa. Same. Helena. Same. <laughs> and Louisa. They were excellent last words. I think uh, we keep it to that. The powers of the people. And as Greta said, we urge many, many more to join. Um, the term activist itself, hopefully, doesn't need to exist um, at some point anymore because people have understood that standing up for right and um, for the right to live and for livelihood shouldn't be an act of activism. But uh, yeah, the most common thing of all. Ma I maybe I can add to the people when I also people on the ground are, are not giving up. Uh, we're Good. still putting up, uh, uh, again, hell of a fight. Fatty, calls for optimism. Uh, now, uh, uh, Steve, what I see is that the, the, this challenge is really very huge. The transforming the entire energy sector, which has been uh, in place decades and decades. And to do that, in addition to technology, government support, and so on, we need one thing in my view, most important. To, to uh, bring together a grand coalition of the people who are genuinely interested to tackle climate change, those governments, civil society, companies who are genuinely interested to address tackle climate change. And I think this grand coalition is happening uh, slowly but surely, and this gives me optimism. And that is very similar to my optimism, the fact that we've got one of the most powerful men in energy sitting on a panel with four of the most powerful activists in climate change. So I just want to thank all of you, Dr. Fatty Birrell. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a good to see you again. Uh, Louisa Neuerbauer, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Helena Gualinga, it's really nice to meet you. Uh, Vanessa Nakate, incredibly powerful. I mean, thank you very much indeed. And Greta Tumbia as well. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, a round of applause, please. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks very much for your time and your patience and your respect and silence. If you could, we're going to do a quick photo with the uh, panel, and then we're going to let them go, as I asked them previously. If you just let them get out of the room and let them go downstairs, and um, you can catch them on down the way. So we'll do a quick photo now. Thank you. Let me put, just pop your phones down. We'll do an uh, iPhone call in a second.